Welcome once again to The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. We're going straight into the newspapers and uh, seeing as many of these major stories that we can share with you this morning, we'll say uh, good morning to our guest who's uh, joining us, uh, Mr. Ezekiel Nyaitok. Good Thank morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Nice to be with you always. Good to see you. All right, let's start with the punch newspapers this morning and see what major stories uh, we can find. Um, the big one there says, uh, experts carpet federal government over 568.5 billion naira vote to, re to repair loss-making Port Harcourt refinery. Uh, project wasteful, senseless, government beaten a dead horse, says uh, economists. New Peng, a union commend government, seek private sector participation. Also, Nigeria's daily oil production rises to 1.42 million barrels. And also a shouting match in the Senate as lawmakers suspend bill to restructure military. Uh, Malabu scam, Nigeria loses $1 billion claim. Italian court acquits ENI and Shell. And also PDP election review panel proposes Northeast, Southeast for 2023 presidency. We also can find this morning uh, the Quara state issues, uh, the hijab violence. Uh, Khan fingers Abdul Razak demands federal government's intervention. OPC members who arrested Wakili charged with murder and arson, says uh, Ghani Adams. And also politicians eyeing 2023 engineering um, violent breakup. I'm not sure what that is about. Southern and Middle Belt leaders are speaking about that. And uh, once um, one more, Southwest ahead as farmers clashes, uh, cases of terrorism, says uh, Yoruba uh, leaders. These are the big ones that we can uh, quickly throw in from the punch this morning. On the Nation newspaper, Oyo, Yobe, others yet to roll out COVID-19 vaccination. Makinde, Wike, Ayade, Diri, Maibuli have not taken vaccine. And now others now say they're unsure how to get the jabs. 2023 president, PDP panel dashes South zoning hope. That's interesting. Tanzania president dies at 61. FECOK's won 1.72 billion naira for road and health contracts. Alleged 900 million naira fraud, ex-JAM registrar detained. Coalition of Yoruba groups form security outfit. Two killed in bandit attack on Emir's convoy. Many injured as pro-anti-hijab clash rocks Ilori. Lagos to complete blue red rail lines in Jakonde's honor. Wike Melafia not excited about $1.5 billion, but Harcourt Refinery Rehabilitation. Well, uh, Pengerson and marketers uh, give it a nod and say it's okay. Those are the stories on The Nation this morning. All right, and of course, uh, still the same uh, big story on the um, uh, Nigerian Tribune this morning. It says federal government to rehabilitate Port Harcourt Refinery with $1.5 billion. Yes, on Wicker says, I will not rejoice yet. We've had enough promises. Also, violence in Ilori over hijab, many injured. Government reopens 10 affected schools. And also, labor to federal government. It's not true you subsidize electricity tariff with 50 billion naira monthly. Ladoja asks uh, his only nominee in Makinde's cabinet to join PDP. And uh, we can also find on the Tribune this morning, Song Wolu announces Leadership Academy to immortalize Jakonde. Police nab five more suspected killers of Fasharanti's daughter. And the drama in the Senate as northern lawmakers frustrate bill for Armed Forces uh, Service Commission. We, okay, we can also find on the Tribune this morning, 2023, PDP committee wants presidential ticket based on merit. Uh, Summit's report on 2019 elections. And, and uh, of course, uh, more of these clashes in Lagos. It says here, 10 injured, 15 arrested as rival courts clash in Lagos. Uh. ICPC, and this is a, an interesting story, ICPC arrest ex-JAM registrar here in day over alleged 900 million naira fraud. That's um, most of the stories that we can find on the Nigerian Tribune this morning. Mm. The Daily Independent is also quite interesting. Forex shortage may grind aviation operations to a halt. Airlines grumble, delay, and cancel flights. Our trade shows federal government $1.5 billion uh, for repairs of Port Harcourt refinery. FECOK is another 3.070 billion naira for NCDC lab equipment. 
OPL 245 Nigeria kicks as Italian court acquits any in shell. Hijab controversy is big across all newspapers, and we're seeing here that after that clash between pro and anti, uh, you know, uh, people who are basically on the hijab controversy in schools in the state, police has restored normalcy in Ilori. PDP throws uh, presidential tickets open. Rising inflation may continue for a longer time, and that's NECA. The cries increase in unemployment rates. Troops rescue 10 kidnapped victims of Kaduna Airport staff quarters. And the ICPC versus uh, ex jam registrar's uh, fraud case. Those are the stories on the front page of uh, the Daily Independent. All right, let's uh, jump right into it. Uh, Mr. Ayatok would uh, most likely start with the one that has made headlines across uh, all the papers this morning, $1.5 billion for Port Harcourt refinery rehabilitation. What are your thoughts? You know, what, one of the things that somebody said that really, um, I wouldn't say infuriated, that I would say got me not just thinking, but largely unhappy. Well, as soon as that came up, he just smiled and said, wow, election is around the corner and there's need for money. And I really felt pained by that. Not because what the person is saying is not factual or doesn't make sense, but I just, I just think that for a nation, why should seeking political office be the most important thing? Is it based on how patriotic that we are that we want to go and serve or how we have just accepted that looting the treasury is the exclusive preserve of these so-called politicians, where everything is about politics. Look at what's going on in the Northeast, but all over Nigeria, especially in the North, and the, 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 the schools. I don't know how many of us have really sat down to really think of the implication of schools being shut down, where children can, are afraid to go to school. I don't know if we've really sat down to think of the larger impact on our country in, in the next 10 years, you know? So you, it so Zayat, me. Talk, you don't, you don't the federal government. believe the government is genuine with this re rehabilitation? Yeah, they, 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 they see it as a means of generating funds. A, Contracts got to be awarded. Things have got to be done. They have to bring out the little... There has to be something that will make them bring out humongous amount. Why is it two years to the end of your administration that you want to think of reviving the... the I mean, it doesn't make sense. Number two, please, can somebody tell me... The, the, you know, I've said this before in uh, maybe about two, three weeks ago. I remember clearly... The clay factory, you know, in, in, in Aquaibom. I went with my governor to, to South Africa. And when we read they just did certain strategic analysis. Okay? When was it produced? By who? What's the technology? Is it still current? We did, you know, a, a, you know, a risk um, assessment. And we did a, a, a very thorough profiling. At the end, they advised us and said, Your Excellency, you are better off leaving that uh, factory and building something new. Okay? Now, can somebody tell me, can the federal government come up with a very, very, very open, transparent blueprint on, number one, why the current technology that is being used there is what is more sustainable, so we need to continue with it. Number two, how it is cheaper for us to continue to build that, then if we think it's so viable, why don't we privatize it? Now, labor comes and says, no, you can't do that. We're not talking of labor. We have to sit down and think of this country. As far as I am concerned, the timing is wrong. Okay. The amount of money is humongous. We have too many needs, immediate needs, education, 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 security. That This is not the time for you to think of such, such humongous amount of money to be thrown into you know, beating a dead horse, like okay. many people have said. All right. Please start by convincing us that um, this, this exercise is in the larger interest of the nation and not where you can pull out a lot amount of money 
So it's a good election come 2023. All right. Mr. Uh, Ezekiel Liaitoka, let's now turn to education. The ICPC um, has alleged that ex jam registrar or Jerry Day uh, basically misappropriated 900, billion, 900 million naira. I took a look at the story and the details were quite shocking. They said he basically allocated a large amount of money for the purchase of pencils and eraser. And when the NP NIPCPC did their findings, they found that he had about two filling stations. He had houses in Ghana, so many, you know, story buildings in different parts of the country. He has a learning center. He, he basically has just so much bars and uh, all of that. He has a marble factory in Kwara State. You know, it's just so much, either th in his name or through his lawyers and people associated with him. This issue, we we'll always talk about, you know, education, education, lack of funding for education. You know, teachers are owed salaries, as is complaining of, you know, the issues they're going through. And we're seeing now that regarding JAM, a foremost, you know, educational uh, exam body in the country, we're seeing that uh, a former registrar has been, you know, it has been detained over 900 million naira fraud. What are your views on this? It, it, it is a story of our lives, unfortunately. We lack systems and processes that make things transparent and accountable. I had really looked forward to this government coming to, you know, I have said it, the enemy of darkness is light. This question of secrecy has, the day it comes to an end, that day we start to have a nation that is moving in the right direction. For instance, it should be very clear and transparent how much money that JAM gets because everything is done electronically. And it does not have to go through the office of the boss. He could have a terminal where he can actually see what is going on. Number two is that the expenses, the expenditure, how much is one pencil? How many children are taking the exams? How, many, how, how much is needed? These are things that can be done very easily and transparently and before you can pull out 900 million and let me even say it when nigerians say 900 million just add another 50 percent to it because that's the one they can see and usually the ones you can't see are always more than the ones you can see because we've learned the art of covering our lives very well i think it's very sad and for jam in particular a lot of these institutions where they are making a lot of money and we still have other bodies, ICPC, uh, you know, and the, and the rest. And how are we monitoring our public office holders? I, I think that the whole you know, public office administration system needs to be looked into again. And let's deploy technology to be able to take care of these things. Outside of that, we just keep... And again, these people are those that fund elections for the government in power. So the man might even say that out of this 900 million, please, can you remember that I gave you on the other election, I gave you maybe 200 million. So, and these are things that you cannot even say openly. I, I, I listened to, to a, a former public officer saying that they are saying things that they've asked him to write memos, but he cannot write it because they are just saying things that he cannot get himself to put on record openly while he's still alive. Because there's okay. so much rot, there's so much nonsense within the system. Wow. And I think that the time has come when Nigerians should rise and decide to take the destiny of this country in our own hands. All right. Ms. Ayatok, I, I, um, I think it's also a good time um, to expose or once again bring back the conversation of uh, corruption in MDAs across the country and not just in, in government offices, not just in uh, political offices. You know, it's also a good time to... Um, talk about how much corruption um, happens in, you know, education, in healthcare, um, and of course in every other government parastatal across the country. Um, so should should we also give kudos to the ICPC for being able to spot this? And you know, how much more of these systems do we need to put in place to ensure that um, we can prevent corruption and stealing on that level? Uh, you know, instead of you know always trying to catch the thief. There are two things. The very first thing is that there are certain systems that the, the system will resist. Because, you know, I'm privileged, I would say, to have a very close relationship with 
maybe as much as I don't know what percentage I will put of the people at the top, at the topmost, because this is a season of people in my age bracket. You know, you discover that your classmate is a, a minister here, another one is the head of this section. This is like our time. So I have a one on one relationship with a lot of the people in power, okay? Governors, senators, heads of parasitals. And one thing will hit you so hard, so bad. The pressure put on these people to bring money for election is evil. It's satanic. The pressure and the blackmail, we're going to remove you. If you don't do it, you're not loyal, you are disloyal. And you've got to bring the money. So how do you bring the money? And when they know you have to bring this money, how are they going to interrogate you? How are they going to put in place systems and processes that will ensure accountability and transparency? We are still bogged by this thing called politics. And I think that the time has come when all men and women and men of conscience must come out and step into politics. Politics is destroying this nation. At the root of all corruption, you will trace it to one thing, politics. Because when you've got to bring out this money, then you also look for a way to also service yourself, okay? And lack of proper reward system. I, I, I told somebody when I was contesting to be a, go a governor, I said, I'll not pay any of my commissioners a dime short of two million a month. And they were shouting, how can you do that? How can you? And I look at this and I say, look at any commissioner that you know, if you are from a state like us. Look at the life they live. Look at the houses. Are you telling me that it is coming from their 800,000 or so that they collect monthly? The answer is no. Give that man a reasonable reward that will get the best to you and give him your red eye. You touch a dime of state's resources, I embarrass you openly. So we are being penny, uh, we, we cover also, wise and naira foolish. You know, we, we also wouldn't rule out the presence of greed uh, amongst you know, some of these persons. But let's, you know, quickly move on. We're, of course, uh, dealing with time here. Let's now talk about the issues in Kwara State over um, hijab. Uh, ten schools were initially shot. You know, there were videos yesterday showing some violence. Gunshots were fired, you know, and um, stones and sticks were thrown here and there. Um, what do you think, you know, is going on and, you know, how do you think all of this can be quickly uh, resolved? We need to be transparent and accountable and we need to draw certain lines. What is a private institution? What is a constitutional provision? Where does it apply? What is a public institution? I can choose to run a Muslim school. For families that want to have their children brought up within the Muslim culture, I can choose to do that. And it is your choice to come to my school or not to come to my school. I can also choose to run um, a public, uh, no, no, a Christian school where I say you must pray in the morning, you must go to chapel, you must do it. It's a choice. It's either you want to come or you don't want to come. And then we will now have the public school. That public school will have certain protocols. It is non-religious. It is strictly secular. So you come in, you obey the principles of, you know, uh, best practices. And, for instance, if you want to work in Central Bank, no matter who you are, there's a certain dress code you must have. If you want to work in any of the banks, if you want to work in any, the, the address codes that you put up in public, I don't know how many people dress anyhow to the court, and yet it's a public institution. But they have those public laws that we operate a non-religious, you know, neutral status. When we bring this to schools, we'll be able to bring about sanity. If this, you want your children to go to a Muslim school, you send them to a Muslim school. You want them to go to a Christian school? I decided that all my children would go to Covenant University, excuse me, because I just wanted that background of Christian and trained. It was a personal decision. Going to chapel every morning, I wanted it. It was a personal choice. Another person, and in my office, it's a law, it's mine. Everybody has his own secret. You must 
pray 10 minutes in the morning. If you don't like it, don't get employed. In my office, you must have that prayer. That's where my strength is. Okay. That's where my secret is. So it's a choice. But in public institutions, there should be a neutrality where you have uniform, everybody abides by it. When you do that, so people now decide they want to go to a Muslim school or they want to go to a Christian school or they want to go to a neutral school. And for each of them, please just obey the rules. All right, All Mr. Right. Isaac Iyachok, uh, I wanted you to address this, this issue. There was a shouting match in the Senate yesterday and it's over a bill to restructure the military. Uh, lawmakers suspended the bill because of the opposition to it. And they, they are saying basically that they want to constitute a, a, an army service commission that would, you know, basically oversee the affairs of uh, the military, control the appointment of service chiefs and all other details within the military. Do you think this is the way to go? What upsets me no end is how people get into the National Assembly without understanding why they are there. Well, they, they understand. They went there to make money, a lot of people. Not everybody, but a lot of them went there to make money. So they understand. And for you to make money, you've got to be loyal. And for you to be loyal, you have to be seen to be doing certain things. How can, look at the headlines in Delhi Independence. Fear of whitting down Buhari's power. Can you imagine a lawmaker personalizing a law? I mean, it is the height of absurdity. It is the height of, of, of ignorance. I don't, know, I don't know the word to use. How can you think of a law and relate it to an individual? It doesn't make sense. So I think that uh, we, we need to, as, 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 as a people, interrogate our leadership profiling you know, no criteria so that we will be able to do that which is necessary and get into National Assembly. The people that understand that they are coming to make laws that have no eyes and they don't see whether it is north or south, east or west, but what is in the larger interest of the nation. I think that is very important. The right. moment we do that, then we start to have a national assembly that has a focus and a direction. And not that, oh, we are whittling down a Buhari's power. I, I'm a Buhari loyalist. I cannot do that. And you forget that in less than two years, the man is gone. And right. another man comes in. You may not like that person, but you've already given that person that power because you were so short-sighted to think that the world ends at the time junction. And it is very annoying. All right, uh, we'll uh, end the, uh, of course, of the press segment here. Uh, big thank you to uh, Zikel Nyayatok. Um, always interested in hearing your perspective on these stories. Uh, of course, uh, have a great uh, day ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, stay with us, of course, here on The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. We'll take a short break. When we come back, what happened today in history? I'm going back to the year 2018 and sharing with you something in sports with one of the greatest sportsmen uh, to ever live.